Now, it's been made clear to me that it's very important to the organisers that you as the audience do not feel that you're only able to speak or ask questions directly around Assange or WikiLeaks. Uh, this conversation and the discussion we're going to have tonight um, is designed to be about the broader context of defending democracy, democratic rights and civil liberties. So I'd encourage you to talk about that if you so, so choose and ask questions on those topics. Now obviously the plight of Assange um, is very important to this discussion, particularly I think as we as Australians have a special responsibility as the only citizenry who can directly demand the protection and the lawful treatment of him as a, an Australian citizen. Uh, but the rise of the war on terror and its mongrel offspring, the surveillance state, um, these are topics that suggest that this discussion is broader than just the plight of Assange. Uh, and you look like a wonderful and diverse audience, and I, I just, most of all, I know that you're very curious about these topics, so I'm looking forward to a broad ranging discussion. Now, before I introduce our panel members, I will um, just, I've just been given the opportunity to make a few comments about WikiLeaks um, and defending democracy, and I take the opportunity to do so. In my view, um, one of the contributions that WikiLeaks has made to journalism and more generally to our understanding of democracy is the importance of speaking truth to power. There is a tendency amongst journalists to become embedded in the processes that they report, or, that they report upon. So if you're fed insider information or what I'd like to call gossip um, about politicians, from politicians, you're much less likely to bite the hand that feeds you um, by being critical of those same politicians. And equally, if you're under the pressure of a deadline, you're more likely to churn out stories based on a company's press release rather than investigative journalism. But this also happens in a military setting. With less journalists reporting independently from the front line and increasing numbers of journalists uh, being embedded within our military forces, it makes criticism of our military forces all the more difficult. Um, in particular today, I read a story about the Los Angeles Times reporting on US soldiers who have had photos taken of themselves with mangled body parts of what seems to be Afghan suicide bombers. Uh, in fact, it seems that the Pentagon tried to res restrict the publication of those photos on the basis that they would, quote, incite violence. Um, the irony of that comment is probably uh, evident to you all, but the point I'm trying to make is that the press doesn't have to be embedded to feel the effects and the influence of the military. And it does uh, ask us to, uh, encourage us to ask questions about the independence of the press in those situations, or the ability of the press to be independent as well. So to address this, we need independent voices who are able to resist the power of the political establishment and the military industrial complex. And WikiLeaks, I think, has shown how this can be done very effectively through modern technological platforms. And it's also demonstrated the need and the usefulness of having an informed public who can look at source material, make their own judgments about it, and then compare it with what journalists are saying, but also importantly, what public figures and politicians are saying as well. But I don't think this is just about journalism. Observing the plight of WikiLeaks also, I think, raises questions about our understanding of freedom and freedom of speech, but also how this relates and is integrated into our democratic process. Um, early this morning, as probably all of you know by now, uh, Jennifer Robinson, a WikiLeaks lawyer and outspoken human rights activist, attempted to board a plane from the UK, where she is a permanent resident, to Australia, where she is a citizen. Uh, she was detained at the UK border and was told, apparently, that she's considered inhibited and required approval from the embassy to travel. Now, as a lawyer who, oh, just so you know, she eventually got on the plane, which is good news. So she'll, she's here, here soon, if not um, in Hong Kong now, thankfully. But as a lawyer who fiercely defends the right to a fair trial and the right to legal representation, it's very disturbing to me that Robinson should, should be put on such a list. Um, she's done nothing more than defend her client in court and in the public domain, as well as speak publicly about many of the issues that we'll be talking about tonight. And troublingly, there are reasons to think that putting Robinson on this list is not in fact the work of the Australian government, but possibly done at the bidding of a foreign power. We don't know enough about this at this point in time, but it's worth asking these questions. And it gives us a tiny but fascinating glimpse into a whole world of secret power that we know almost nothing about, and yet it can have such profound effects on our lives. And in my view, it highlights the greater need, um, more so than ever, for transparency. Transparency in the exercise of power and government decision making. I mean, it's ironic as well because Robinson is actually quite the opposite of inhibited. Um, I hardly think any of you are inhibited either. I'm feeling pretty uninhibited tonight. Um, so if the government's going to try and put me or any of you on the inhibited list, I think we need to say no to that. 
I think we need to commit to being as uninhibited as we can possibly be in defence of civil liberties and democracy. So that's the power part of speaking truth to power, but I also think there's a truth part to it. Um, when I talk to people about WikiLeaks and particularly Julian Assange, it never ceases to astonish me how little people know about the proceedings Assange is currently involved in, and in fact how many myths there are out there. Um, as we meet here, I imagine that the UK Supreme Court is putting its final touches on its judgment of his appeal. Um, and anyone who's interested in these particular topics, in my view, has a duty to make sure they know the facts and can, and, and this can be the subject of questions tonight if you so choose, and further discussion. Assange is waiting for a decision about a European arrest warrant issued by Sweden to the UK. So the European Arrest Warrant Framework, or as it's more commonly known, EAW Framework, was drafted in a notorious hurry. It was done in the wake of um, the fear of terrorism in the wake of 9-11. This framework streamlined the extradition process between European countries at the expense of very fundamental rights. Assange, to date, has not been charged with any crime, uh, and yet he is held without bail, and has been held without bail for a significant period of time. What we do know about the factual allegations that have been made about this um, particular uh, set of proceedings is that it would be unlikely to constitute a crime in either uh, the UK or Australia. He has every right to defend himself and resist this process of extradition. And his plight, in fact, draws attention to um, the fundamentally flawed nature of the EAW framework and some very appalling cases of injustice in relation to that, the exercise of those powers under the EAW framework. The other thing I think Assange has a right to be concerned about is uh, what will happen to his rights should he end up in the United States. Um, and, and, and there's reason to believe that that will occur if he ends up in Sweden. Uh, documents released by WikiLeaks, as you probably all already know, suggest that the US government is planning um, at least the process of charging Assange, although we know very little about that process. Um, but what I think Assange should be worried about is the fact that the National Defence Authorisation Act was passed by Barack Obama last year, and it permits the US government to hold people indefinitely without charge. This is a highly objectionable provision, and it should, be not test it should not be tested out under any circumstances, and the Australian government should be doing everything it can to protect Assange from this outcome. There's plenty of material online which explains more about the processes that I just discussed in more detail, and I'd strongly encourage you to seek that out so that we can all take responsibility for speaking truth to power and for educating others about the greater principles that are at stake in this situation. But you've heard enough from me. Um, I'll hand over now to the first of our panellists. I'll just let you know who our panellists are. So there's Bernard Keane, Scott Ludlam, who will be joining us very shortly, Greg Barnes and Silette Dreyfus in replacement of Christine. Um, there'll be plenty of time for discussion at the conclusion of the panellists' contributions, so I'd encourage you to hold on to your questions um, until that moment. Uh, but I'd firstly like to introduce Bernard Keane. Bernard has been Crikey's correspondent in Canberra since 2008, and he writes on politics, media and economics. Well... Thank you, Lizzie. I uh, hope that works. Um, and, and thank you to everyone who's come along tonight. This is a fantastic turn up, so uh, to well done to all of you. Um, I want to start with a... try and paint a bit of a picture of a world maybe a couple of years from now. Uh, it's a world where everything you say and do online and on a phone can be monitored. And if it's not monitored, it can be recorded and stored for later use. It's a world where your ISP watches everything that you download because it's terrified of losing its safe harbour status if it doesn't police file sharing. It's a world where even linking to a downloading site might see you extradited to the United States because the US thinks that its laws should apply globally. And it's a world where foreign governments can ask our government to provide them with the records of what you've been doing online or with your phone, all in the name of fighting the war on crime or the war on drugs or the war on terror. But in this world, the war on terror isn't designed ever to be won. In fact, it's actually designed not to be won. It's designed to keep on going 
because it's good for business. It's good for, it's good for governments because it justifies the extension of their powers and it's good for companies, particularly um, arms companies and security companies. And it's designed to keep on going because the war on terror, one of its primary consequences, is to endlessly create new terrorists. More terrorists from people enraged by Western military action that slaughters civilians. More terrorists created by law enforcement agencies inciting, encouraging, and giving weapons to radical young Muslim men, or even in some cases, mentally unwell young men, and then declaring that they foiled a terrorist plot. And most of all, creating more terrorists because we are endlessly expanding the definition of terrorism. It used to be that if you made a joke about a bomb on a plane that you got arrested, these days, if you make a joke about a bomb on a plane on Twitter, you get arrested. The extension of the definition of terrorism, uh, the remorseless extension, um, is, we've seen it most recently with the extension of definition of terrorism to computer hacking. And of course, the Vice President of the United States has called Julian Assange a high-tech terrorist for the offence of revealing information that's embarrassing to a government. So if you want a classic case of definitional creep, then terrorism is a classic example. It's a world where di diplomats are simply the agents of their country's biggest corporations, representing their interests and, if necessary, demanding changes to their host country's laws. And it's where the media, supposedly the watchdog on power, is actually part of the power elite, owned by the biggest companies or by the richest billionaires or pursuing their own commercial interests. Above all, it's, where there, it's a world where there is an asymmetry between governments and corporations and us. Where governments and corporations insist on hiding their activities, not telling us what they're doing, while demanding ever greater amounts of personal information from us. Information that can be strip mined by companies in order to sell us more stuff. Information that can be compiled by governments to enable them to better monitor us. Now, of course, as most of you will have guessed, I'm not describing some dystopia of a couple of years' time. I'm describing the world right now. Everything I've said to you just now is happening somewhere in the world right now, and a lot of it is actually happening right here in Australia. This is the pushback against the internet and the interconnectedness that the internet brings. It's the reaction of governments and corporations to the way that the internet flattens the information hierarchies and systems of control that they've relied on for so long. And it's the resentment of corporate elites and their political allies to the communities that are being formed right across the globe, free of geography and government restriction and fueled by digital information. There's a cliche that's been floating around the internet for a long time that in information wants to be free. Well, information doesn't have any agency. It doesn't want anything. But what is the case is that information is now much, much easier to make free. That's what the internet does. It reduces all information, whether it's the most top secret and exciting information or the most anodyne, whether it's, uh, whether it's who shot JFK or who won the gold Logie, reduces it all to a simple stream of digits. For most of the last 2,000 years, information distribution has been a matter of grams per square metre. Now it's a matter of zeros and ones. And the attack on WikiLeaks is part of this pushback. WikiLeaks has been smeared. It's been accused of computer hacking, of revealing information detrimental to national security, of placing individuals at risk. None of these things have ever actually been proved about WikiLeaks. The company that they have been proved about, in fact, the company that has admitted doing all of those things is Rupert Murdoch's News International. Alas, there's no international financial blockade of Rupert Murdoch's companies. The, the international blockade is directed at WikiLeaks. 
there's blockades of other forms as well. If Lizzie has already talked about Jen Robinson being stopped at Heathrow this morning and being told that she's a... Um, and what was the word? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, before being allowed on a plane. There's, we've seen this before. Jacob Applebaum, a uh, uh, guy associated with the Tor program, is, uh, has, uh, and a well-known WikiLeaks supporter, his fate for, I think, 18 months or so was every time he returned to the United States was to be stopped and searched and have everything that he had on him searched by the Department of Homeland Security. We've seen this business of stopping people from travelling before. And that's why it is so important that we find out what on earth happened to Jen Robinson and demand answers from our government and from other governments about what happened. And as we know, there's a sealed indictment of Julian Assange in the United States, probably for espionage, we don't know, based on, we assume, the argument that WikiLeaks is not a media organisation or it's not like other media organisations. And of course, there's actually a little bit of truth in that, isn't there? WikiLeaks is different to mainstream media organisations. That's because it does what so many mainstream media organisations say they do, which is tell us things that the people at the very most senior levels of power really don't want us to know. We take the New York Times, for example. The Times relies heavily on anonymous leaked information from Washington. But it's information leaked by the administration. It's official leaks. There's no whistleblowers involved. It's all information that's been doled out by the people in power in the interests of preserving their power or prosecuting a political agenda. There's even a case here in Australia. I mean, look at Fairfax. Fairfax even got the WikiLeaks cables, diplomatic cables, and proceeded to do stories on them without actually releasing the cables so that we could actually see what they said, refusing to release them for its own commercial purposes. The attack on WikiLeaks is, I think, an attempt at exemplary punishment. Exemplary punishment is what regimes do when the opposition to them is too diffuse or too, there's just too much of it to actually take on. The theory is you punish the people that you can get your hands on so brutally that it serves as an example to others. And the attack on WikiLeaks say that governments and corporations want it both ways. They want to preserve this information asymmetry. They want to use the internet to extend their control over citizens while guarding themselves from its implications. And that's why defending WikiLeaks and defending the broader cause of transparency and defending our rights online and off is so important. So it seems to me WikiLeaks sends a signal to governments and corporations. The signal is that there is no safe place for them. That if they want to impose a surveillance state on us, then we'll impose one on them, that we're a global community. And even if they lock up Julian Assange and they shut down WikiLeaks and they arrest hackers and they pass ever more draconian laws to enable ASIO to spy more effectively on us, they won't make a dent on our capacity to watch what they're doing because we are tens of millions strong, we are global, and we've got more processing power up here and in our computers than they do. Because it seems to me that if governments and corporations want to turn all this into a consumer panopticon, where the only goal is to be better monitored so you can buy stuff, buy more stuff, and be a compliant citizen, the only thing that's going to stop them is for us to shame them and to expose what they're doing. To convince them that it's not worth their while because we're going to show what they do every step of the way. And that ultimately is why this is a bigger issue than, than uh, WikiLeaks itself or Anonymous or uh, internet security. It's an issue that spans all our rights. That's where the defence starts. The defence starts right here with WikiLeaks. Thanks.
Thanks, Bernard. Uh, next, we've got Greg Barnes. Uh, Greg is a barrister and writer, and he's the national president of the Australian Lawyers Alliance and practices in the areas of criminal law and human rights in Tasmania, Victoria and Western Australia. Um, can I also acknowledge the original um, owners of this land? Um, I want to say a few things firstly about Jennifer Robinson from the, pers the perspective of lawyers and the Australian Lawyers Alliance today uh, made a statement in relation to this matter in which we effectively said that uh, a strong, robust and independent legal profession is uh, an integral part of a democratic society for one very fundamental reason that it is lawyers and lawyers alone who take up unpopular causes and champion them on behalf of individuals against the executive and against parliaments when bad laws are passed, when unjust decisions are taken by the executive. I can think of Stephen Keim, who in Brisbane acted uh, for Mohammed Hanif. I can think of those who acted for uh, the accused persons in the Melbourne and Sydney terrorism trials. Uh, I can think uh, of uh, Jennifer Robinson uh, and her role as instructing solicitor uh, in the case involving Julian Assange. Uh, I have not heard of a case where a lawyer has been placed on a list, which in this case uh, is probably an American-generated list. Uh, I've certainly heard of clients of mine who have been put on lists, but never a lawyer. And I think that uh, all Australian lawyers and all lawyers around the world ought to be uh, very disturbed at the treatment of one of their own uh, simply because she's acting for an unfashionable client. In the context of a, a wealthy democracy like Australia, it's reasonable for us to have the expectation that if you are arrested or charged in a foreign country, then the Australian government will provide you with consular assistance. One certainly would not expect that the Australian government would do everything in its power to shop you to a foreign country or a third country. But as we know, that is exactly what has happened to the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. Any day now, the UK Supreme Court will rule on Mr Assange's appeal against a decision by the English courts to allow his extradition to Sweden, where he faces questioning in relation to what are even on the most benign view, politically driven criminal charges. Make no mistake that if Mr Assange loses his appeals, he will go to Sweden and he will be placed in solitary confinement and held without charge for a long period. Uh, that country will then hand him on to the Americans uh, without quibble, who will subject him to torture and cruelty such as solitary confinement, again for long periods of time. The Americans will, of course, then pat Australia's political elite on the head, telling him what good boys and girls they've been. With the notable exception of the principled Liberal frontbencher and my old Republican mate Malcolm Turnbull, the Denison Independent Andrew Wilkie and the Greens and Senator Scott Ludlam, who's here tonight, the rest of Canberra, it has to be said, has been happy to sell one of their own down the river from the day Mr Assange lifted the lid on the duplicitous and scheming world of international diplomacy and military actions. The actions of Prime Minister Julia Gillard and the current Attorney General Nicola Roxon have, in my view, been particularly appalling. Ms Gillard, forever trying to please and appease her Washington buddies, declared that Mr Assange should be charged under Australian law. What was extraordinary about this statement that Ms Gillard is a lawyer and as a lawyer, it must have occurred to her that she was being intellectually dishonest and simply lying to the Australian people in this absurd call, given that there was no jurisdictional reach on the part of the Australian government because Mr Assange's operations were in Sweden. And back in February last year, when Mr Assange appealed to Ms Gillard's, for Ms Gillard's assistance in relation to the Swedish charges, she dismissed his plea with this comment. There's not anything we can or indeed should do about that. This is what she said on February the 2nd last year. Let's contrast that with Australians who get caught in Bali with a bit of dope on them. Accepting the disgraceful handling by the Australian Federal Police of the Bali Nine, whom they allowed to be caught in a country, knowingly uh, allowed to be caught in a country with the death penalty, Australians are generally, we find, uh, 
people like Ms Gillard, Mr Rudd, uh, and anyone in the Foreign Affairs Department, diplomatic officials, scuttling off to Bali in order to appease the tabloids. Ms Roxon, though, has been equally troubling. Again, Ms Roxon is a lawyer and should know better. Last week, she told the ABC, uh, if you're in another country or breaking the laws of another country, we've made very clear that we want all the proper processes to apply. We've made very clear that Assange is an Australian and that he's welcome to come home to Australia. The facts of Mr Assange's case belie this comment from the Attorney General. The Swedish case against Mr Assange is an abusive process, has always been an abusive process, and Ms Roxon knows that to be a fact. The prosecutor in the case is actively involved in what might be described as sexual politics in Sweden and has been accused of assuming guilt of anyone arrested on a sexual assault charge. I might say as an aside, she's not the only prosecutor or police officer who has that mentality. And the Swedish legal system is unfair and inhumane. Here's what Anne Lamberg, the head of the Swedish Lawyers Association, said on May 5 last year. The European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Other Humane and Degrading Treatment and the UN Committee Against Torture have criticised Sweden for long detention periods and we agree that they can be incredibly long. We have also repeatedly through the years challenged trials behind closed doors, as well as the lay judges, but on the grounds that it recruits from a limited pool of people rather than the politicisation of the courts. In other words, the Swedish justice system is the sort of justice system you might get in an authoritarian regime. So if Ms Roxon is so keen on ensuring the Swedes apply proper process, why isn't she doing more then to assist Mr Assange? And why isn't Ms Gillard calling her Swedish counterpart to give him both barrels on the same issue? The answer is, of course, that neither Ms Gillard nor Ms Roxon, nor Mr Abbott for that matter, could really care less about Mr Assange being returned to Sweden because they are all in the thrall of Washington. That this is the case is evident by the fact that the US is nobbling Australian government officials over freedom of information requests concerning cables between Washington and Canberra over WikiLeaks. The Americans do not want materials released and are plainly and blatantly interfering in the workings of a foreign government, namely Australia. Then there's the official Australian government line on Assange, which of course presumes and assumes that he's done something criminally wrong and that he's guilty. It is straight out of the US State Department's handbook of spin. A letter sent recently by Anna Harmer, a senior official in the Attorney General's Department in Canberra, says that WikiLeaks actions in releasing US diplomatic cables is reckless, irresponsible and potentially dangerous. Again, as an aside, why is it reckless, irresponsible and potentially dangerous when Mr Assange releases material, but it's OK when Ms Gillard does it, Ms Roxon does it, Mr Abbott does it and President Obama does it? The case of Julian Assange reflects poorly on Australia. I think it teaches us all a lesson that if you get into trouble overseas, and your plight interferes with Canberra's political interests, then you'll be fed to the wolves, while politicians cry, cry crocodile tears over your plight. It's incumbent, in my view, on all Australians to be extremely concerned about what is happening to Julian Assange. In some senses, uh, he is like the Bali Nine. That is, that we have Australian authorities uh, police and security authorities and foreign affairs officials and uh, prime ministers who are prepared uh, quite openly to sacrifice the interests of their own citizens in order to pursue a broader political agenda. In the case of the Bali Nine, it was because the Australian Federal Police, with their obsession with counter-terrorism counter and, and spooks under the beds, decided that they were going to get into bed with their Indonesian counterparts and they were prepared to sell out young people, despite the fact that the father of one of those young people told the federal police that they, his kid had drugs and why didn't they arrest him at Brisbane airport. In the case of Mr Assange, this is a demonstrable 
way in which the Australian government and the Australian body politic, with the notable exceptions that I mentioned earlier, are prepared on occasion after occasion to prove to the world that Australia, when it comes to foreign policy, is extraordinarily sycophantic towards the United States in a way that is embarrassing in the 21st century with the rise of China. And that Mr Assange is being sacrificed for simply revealing uh, what we all knew to be the case, and that is that the war in Iraq was folly and that the war in Afghanistan similarly so, that he is being punished on trumped up charges by a jumped up Swedish prosecutor who's more interested in pursuing a political agenda through the courts than according justice, is, I think, something which should deter disturb every Australian. Because everyone in this room and every member of your family is at risk from an Australian government which does not take seriously its obligations, its fundamental human rights and legal obligations and moral obligations to ensure the safety of Australians when they are overseas. Thank you. Mm. Nice work. Thank you, Greg. Uh, our next speaker is Scott Ludlam, who's made it from Tullamarine in record time in a bit of a superhuman effort. Um, he's an Australian Green Senator from Western Australia and he's the Green spokesman on such issues as communications, housing, mining and nuclear power. Thanks, Lizzie. Sorry I'm late getting here. It was not record time. We got as far as the city and then everything just stopped. Aren't there a lot of us? Good evening. It's really, really great to be here um, and to follow on from our two inspiring speakers so far. I'm starting to feel like our job really and uh, part of the work of tonight is to help make this thing a defining issue for this term of government. It bugs me a great deal. Um, I don't disagree with anything that the, that the earlier speakers have said and in Bernard's characterisation of this, I think in the big picture, um, I would not be able to do better than that. I want to help fill in some of the detail, I suppose, and observe that if the Howard government, with a Philip Ruddock Attorney General, had been doing the things that these folk are up to, probably we would have been holding demonstrations 10,000 strong out front of Parliament House. And that's something to reflect on, because we're not. Now we're here. There are an awful lot of us. I just follow some of, the, some of the relevant hashtags on Twitter, watch how this is playing out in the media, online, and at events such as this to know that there are a lot of us. There are a great deal of us who are very, very concerned about this issue. It cuts across politics. I think it cuts across party politics, certainly. So we're out there. We're in numbers. We're strong. But we haven't hit that political pain threshold yet in the sense that the Prime Minister, the new Attorney General, apart from a couple of minor examples, and the new Foreign Minister, have been able to very successfully stay out of the debate. Just stay out of it. Okay, since the PM and, and former attorneys really unguarded comments a year and a half ago about how this stuff was all illegal, they've completely stayed out of the debate, and they've been able to do that because we don't have an effective opposition at the moment. We don't have a shadow attorney general in this country who's interested in anything more than politics. So it's to politics that we'll have to go. Um, we've run, I've, I've attended a couple of these events around the country since late last year and have been gradually changing my views around whether there's a certain amount of neglect going on here, whether they're just too busy, or whether this is hostile action. And of course that is precisely what it is. This is really about the criminalisation of dissent right across the board. Um, put your hand up if you are concerned about climate change, for example. A room full of terrorists. <laughs> who knew? Who knew? So now ASIO are spying on people who are conducting, in my view, entirely legitimate activities of dissent around climate change, around arguably the greatest issue facing this generation and the one coming through now. We are being spied on by clandestine organisations designed during the Cold War to spy on uh, each other, and then later their mission morphed into spying on terrorists, on people organising acts of politically motivated violence and horror that no one here would support. 
And now climate change demonstrators, people working on peace issues, on animal rights issues, sea shepherds and others, are the target of these very same organisations using the same legal structures that were set up post 9-11 to go after politically motivated violence. We've come to a pretty dangerous place. So I think this is, uh, these are hostile acts. The neglect, the staying out of the media, are acts of hostility rather than neglect. Sorry, these mics are a bit hissy. A couple of things. So generally the public statements from the government have been either absent from the debate or they've been deeply unhelpful when they have occurred. There have been enormous delays in evasion of freedom of information requests that I and a number of others have been making in the last couple of months through the PM's office, the Attorney's office, Foreign Minister's office, trying to work out exactly the degree either of ignorance or complicity, because they can't have it both ways, of the Australian government. Do they know about the sealed indictment? Do they know what it's for? We know that they were asked, they, the, our lot asked the US government last year to just be tipped off. If you're going to come after the guy, if you're going to try and lock him up, if you're going to move for extradition, please give us a heads up. That's extraordinary. So that they can manage the messaging, you know, so they can roll out their side of the story. That's what we're dealing with here. So I put in a bunch of freedom of information requests and we got, we st they started trickling back. Four months of delay and frustration. Check it out. We're being attacked by black rectangles. This is one of my favourites. You're getting that on camera? They blacked out a Senate motion that I wrote. It's sensitive stuff. It's paranoia, among other things. Harassment of supporters, including legal counsel, and this particularly creepy example that we heard this morning about Jen being detained at Heathrow briefly. That's, you know, someone who's former legal counsel. Now, I think uh, it is becoming very creepy, and that is something that uh, we're really urgently going to need to get to the bottom of, because there appear to be these kind of spider webs all over the place. And in particular, covering up for the US government, simply covering for these activities. If you want to know what the playbook is and how this was going to be rolled out, have a look at wikileaks.org. There's a wonderful PDF there of a bunch of consultants pitching to the US government two or more years ago how to pull apart a civil society organisation, how to rip apart, too quiet, how to rip apart a publishing organisation that operates as a network the way this one does. And then you go back and have a look at the Strat4 emails and they describe how those plans were put into operation, how it was done attack, destroy the funding base, do character assassination, ruin people's re uh, reputations, and shop Julian Assange and his associates around through as many different legal jurisdictions. It doesn't matter whether we get convictions or not. They couldn't care less if they convict him in Sweden. They couldn't care less. It's cost him nearly 500 days under house arrest. Bingo, job done. With a foot nailed to the floor, the remarkable thing is they've managed to maintain uh, publishing credible and important work like the spy files, like the Strat4 emails, uh, and now he's even got his own TV show, so who knows. They've stayed busy, but this is with an electronic ankle bracelet and having to report to the cops once a day. And that, that was the plan. That was laid out in the PowerPoint, and then you can read it in the Strat4 emails, exactly how they're planning on doing this. 20, 30 years, shopping him through all these legal jurisdictions, destroying his name and the work of the people doing it. And so now, I think somebody did an analysis of articles in maybe it was The Guardian. How many, uh, Guardian, how many articles did they print about Julian Assange? How many articles have they printed about the work of WikiLeaks, about things like war crimes, what went on in Guantanamo Bay, uh, running false flag operations in Yemen with missile strikes, for example? And of course, the preponderance of articles is about the strange Australian guy with white hair and dirty socks. You know, it's all, it's all part of it. Just in terms of context, uh, in Parliament at the moment, we're tracking two major trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement and also ACTA, which was signed but not ratified, which will potentially quite severely impact on, uh, as, as, as I think Bernard hinted at, uh, the role that internet service providers play as carriers, as the post box transmitting information uh, from, from you to, to whatever you're interested in and in our freedom to communicate online. But these trade agreements are being set up. They are not being set up in our interests, believe me. They're happening uh, in these kind of clandestine meetings where people are consulted by which they say, tell us what you think and, and we'll, we'll table an agreement and ratify it sometime down the track and pay no attention whatsoever to what you put up. 
And most importantly, I think, the ascension to the European Convention on Cybercrime is another big one in those three, which radically lowers the threshold over which we can be spied upon and surveilled online, and then that material be passed off to foreign governments. Quarter of a million requests in the most recent year for which we've got reliable data by the police and intelligence services, not including ASIO and ASIS, for telecommunications data. So your IP address, which tells, you, tells these law enforcement agencies or Centrelink or whoever, where you were at the time that you sent that email, where you were when you, sent that, when you made that phone call, locational data, who it was that you emailed, bank transaction details, all this kind of stuff, a quarter of a million requests by these different agencies in one year. And the threshold for applying for those is virtually zero. And more than 200 people in the federal police alone can apply for those. It's just paperwork. And that is the world that we're moving into. And it's all being carried along under the cover of quite legitimate, in my view, agendas of, for example, preventing people from blowing up railway stations or taking out aircraft. So that's the agenda that we're told about. And riding along behind it in quite parasitic form are these other agendas which are about surveillance and control and trying to prevent the emergence of what I think is a powerful and very exciting global civil society that we are all a part of. So one organisation that of course has become the lightning rod for this uh, is the organisation WikiLeaks. And as Australians, we have a special responsibility. We know we do as global citizens as well, but as holders of Australian passports, and electors, people who can vote in this Australian parliament, we have a special responsibility to look after an Australian citizen who has found himself, legitimately or not, in the firing line for this huge and diffuse global movement towards global civil society and global democracy. So we're on the threshold of major change tonight. I think some of us thought the Supreme Court would have handed its findings down by now, so something's holding them up. It's a, a major test case that doesn't even go to the merits or otherwise of WikiLeaks, but around the way European arrest warrants work. That could happen tonight, could be happening as we speak. And then things will happen very fast. We might see the sealed indictment rapidly unsealed. They will then move to extradite him. That could cost Julian another two or three years under house arrest or properly incarcerated if they judge him a flight risk, while the legal teams battle out whether he should be extradited to the United States or not. And that's fine. The US administration would be fine if it took five years to extradite him. Fantastic. That's what it says in the Stratfor emails. Just pin him down. Keep him pinned down forever. My message to the Australian government tonight is that, look, this will come out. You can send us as much of this crap as you like, OK? But this stuff will come out. And that is the lesson of WikiLeaks, is that there are people, there are allies all the way through into the PM's office, all the way through state and federal governments, in the intelligence agencies, in the army, I found out last week. We've got friends and allies and people who believe the same basic things that we believe about freedoms and democracy all through the system. We haven't hit the tipping point yet, but I think it is very, very important that we do. Hit the banks. These banks have brands that need to be protected. How many of you have MasterCards or Visa cards here? Hands up. I do this every meeting. It's getting a bit boring if you've seen this happen twice. About three quarters of the room. Keep your hand up if you have written to MasterCard or Visa. That's not enough, crew. Just write a letter, two paragraphs to your credit card company saying, I signed a contract with you people and you have dishonoured it. I have the right to make transactions to a publishing organisation. Please explain the legal basis under which you're blocking financial transactions to WikiLeaks. And let's make a ruckus online. People, this is our medium. We're, we're out of control out there. We cannot be controlled. So let's make a big ruckus online. I'm actually not worried that we're 10,000 strong out front of Parliament House. Maybe this isn't the campaign for that, but we are many millions strong online, and let's sharpen the message and carry it forward and look out for each other as that happens. Make connections, grab a coffee or a beer after this meeting tonight. People that you might have only met as a Twitter handle, um, get to know them because we're going to be working together for a while yet. Thanks very much for coming along. Thank you, Scott. Uh, our final speaker is Dr. Silet Dreyfus. Uh, Silet is a research fellow and journalist and is also the author of Underground, a work of literary nonfiction, which she co-wrote with Julian Assange. So if I can 
hold this and it's not echoing too much. There we go. Good evening. Um, I want to talk about two things tonight. Um, first, I'd like to say uh, I'm very sorry that Christine Assange couldn't come tonight. And aside from having the flu, as a mother myself, I could not possibly imagine how difficult it must be for her to see her son in this terrible predicament simply for standing up for democratic principles of free speech and publishing the truth. So my heart goes out to her. The two things I want to talk about tonight are money and democracy. So the first thing I want to talk about is not money causing corruption, democracy, but rather about how we spend our money as a society here in Australia, how we choose to spend it. So I thought I'd just roll out a couple of figures and leave you with a question. We spend about $365 million a year on ASIO that we know of, which is about a million dollars a day. And if you throw in the other intelligence and security agencies, it's probably more than twice that. So you might estimate it at perhaps a billion dollars a year on those agencies if you throw in the AFP. It's interesting to compare that to how much we spend on, say, the most defenseless members of our society, that is children at high risk, children who need special protection from the state. And on that, across the country, we might spend in the order of about $600 million, so a little more than half of what we spend on the security agencies. My question is, are we at a time, are we at a place in our society where we have reached security saturation, where every additional dollar that we spend on the war on terror and the security state is money burned? It's not money that's adding a lot of value. We could use that money for things like children at risk, for schools, for hospitals. I don't know if we are at that security saturation point, but I think it's a really good time for us to stop and ask that question. And nobody is asking that question. The second thing that I want to talk about tonight is democracy. We are living in an era of crackdown. But it's not so much a crackdown on crime and a crackdown on terror. In a sense, we've almost passed those eras. It has become a crackdown on democratic behaviors. We have swung so far with this pendulum that this is the point we are at. So it is a crackdown on the Occupy movement. And this isn't just Australia, it's the US, it's other countries as well. It's a crackdown, police attacks on peaceful protesters in the Occupy movement with New York City police beating peaceful occupiers who only want to engage on the important democratic issues of our time, which is this disparity between the 99% and the 1% and the level of corruption that's been involved in the banking and financial industry that has allowed that to come to pass. It's about a crackdown on the Occupy movement here in Melbourne, where a peaceful protester, a young woman, was wearing a tent to a protest as part of the flavor of the protest, and police came and held her down on the ground and tore and cut the tent off her body and left her in the treasury gardens in nothing but her bra and her underwear and walked away. And this was somehow seen to be acceptable by the police. It is an example of the crackdown on democratic behaviors or the crackdown on publishing documents about the way government really works, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, as he well knows. It's interesting, I find it um, uh, interesting to follow a campaign on the internet you may have seen called epicstep.com, which is raising funds to place outdoor posters around Washington, D.C. in support of Bradley Manning, the alleged whistleblower. Uh, and uh, they need to raise about $4,000 more before they'll go on with their next campaign. But the poster that has been most popular that they will promote in the outdoor advertising campaign has a picture of Bradley Manning, and it says next to his name, whistleblower. And then it has a dictionary style definition underneath. And it says, noun, a person who tells the people what the government doesn't want us to know. Now I work in the whistleblowing research area. It's never a definition I've actually seen before, but it's a very interesting definition. 
and it shows where we're at in this culture, in this time and place, uh, in this crackdown of democratic behaviors. It's a time of crackdown of peaceful, on peaceful activists in the environment movement, as already been mentioned earlier this evening. There was a very interesting question on q and I I don't know if you saw it uh, earlier this week from uh, a young man from Carleton who was a peaceful environmental um, activist and who'd been visited at home by the security services. Um, it's a crackdown in the form of no-fly lists, as we saw this morning with lawyer Jennifer Robertson, who is a human rights activist as well as being a lawyer for um, WikiLeaks. It's, it's a, uh, she was told she was an inhibited person and she couldn't travel without contact with the Australian High Commission in London, with Australia House. I think this is very interesting and I'll, I'll come back to this. It's a crackdown that's also about secret lists. And those lists include things that say, do not give this person a job. And I know of at least one case where it would appear that was what was involved. Or it might also be another list, do not give this person a promotion. Because they are engaged in democratic activities. So where do we find ourselves as a democracy today as a result of these crackdown on democratic activities in the era of WikiLeaks and of Julian Assange? We find ourselves better informed, but more oppressed. And it's a strange dichotomy to be better informed, but more oppressed. Things may have to get worse before they get better, we may have to get to the place where only the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT, or perhaps only the US military or intelligence agencies can decide if those of us who are engaging in democratic activities have the right to fly to our country of citizenship. The turning point will be when good people step forward. And I share the tipping point observation made by Scott. I think good people are already starting to step forward and it's going to happen more and more. So maybe good people will step forward to defend Jennifer Robertson and those good people could include the Rhodes Scholars Club or the legal fraternity of which she's a part or the anti-war club or the Friends of WikiLeaks Club or maybe Anonymous or even Occupy. The idea that we are all Julian Assange may really be coming to fruition and in a way that we can all see at home. So now would be a good time to step forward. And there are things that you can do. Do not feel powerless. First, get on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter and make noise. Follow WikiLeaks and other organizations that promote freedom of speech and are trying to inch back our capabilities when it comes to engaging in democratic activities. Join the 1.4 million followers of WikiLeaks. Join EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, follow WL Legal, any number of other people who are engaged in these activities. Make your voice heard in Twitter and other ways. Find DFAT's Twitter account. Ask them difficult questions. Better still, find the US Embassy account here in Australia and ask them to put questions to the US ambassador about Julian Assange. Ask them if the alliance between Australia and the US is, quote, rock solid. Why is it relentlessly pursuing a peaceful Australian citizen? If you're unhappy with these things, tell them. Write to your politicians. It works, it really does work. Tell them to stop hedging and speaking, you know, and tell them to speak up to bring Julian Assange home to Australia and to defend him. Tell them to use their special relationship and influence with the United States to look after their own citizens. Say it to labor and say it to liberals. Make them listen. They pay attention, ironically enough, to dead tree letters. Um, and if you don't like what they're doing, tell them you won't be voting for them at the next election. Tell them one more thing, and this is an appeal from me because I do research in the whistleblowing area. 
Tell them you want better laws to protect whistleblowers in Australia. We were promised better federal legislation for last June. It hasn't appeared yet. We wonder what that legislation will be like. Will it have teeth or will it just be paper tiger? Tell them you want real legislation to protect whistleblowers because it's important to the integrity of a society. It's important to a society that has people who pursue democratic activities. And that it needs to apply to everyone in government, including the intelligence services, including law enforcement, because there can be wrongdoing done in any of these organizations. And the people who are willing to reveal and expose wrongdoing at great personal cost need to be protected, not by ombudsman's offices by themselves, not by their own organizations, but by the law. Because the morality of one man or woman in these instances of wrongdoing is our last best hope. So I would say to you that the power is in your hands. Use it. Okay, so you should all be able to hear me, which I hope you can. Um, we now have time for questions and discussion. So as your moderator, I make the rules for this discussion and you will be following them and I will rule with an iron fist. Um, you, you have the right to freedom of expression, of course, but with that right comes responsibilities. So you may ask questions. There are three people uh, with microphones. You can see their hands raised now. You must go and queue at that location and you will, be wait, we will wait your turn until I call you to ask a question or make a comment. If you wish to make a comment, I ask that you please do it succinctly and I reserve the right to cut you off. Um, the other thing I'd say is that uh, you can actually ask a question via the hashtag. Um, the hashtag is WLADD. It needs to be in cap It doesn't need to be in capitals, but that is what it is. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all really. Just think of me as a Generation Y version of Tony Jones. Okay, so who is there? Anyone? I can't see anyone. Oh yes, you've got one queue here. Take it away, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Melbourne. Uh, my name's Yikes. I work with Occupy Melbourne, and I'm really proud to be here tonight. I'm really proud to be an Australian. The one thing I wanted to ask the panel was, would they like to tell the audience a little bit about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which was recently negotiated in Melbourne at the Melbourne Exhibition Centre, which is an agreement between nine different countries. I was wondering particularly if they could talk about the ramifications of that for medicine and also for online freedom. Thank you. Do I have a member of the panel who would wish to speak? Oh, oh, oh am, I, am I on? Yeah. <laughs> My life. I think you're on. Um, Look, um, TPP is the, the process is ongoing. There is a the, the, it is a international agreement involving United States, Australia, New Zealand, and a bunch of other countries, including Chile, and I can't reel them all off, but I know Brunei is in there as well. It is, in essence, those of you who who, who followed the um, the the fate of the ACTA, the anti copyright, anti counterfeit, anti copyright, anti mm -hmm. anti counterfeiting mm -hmm. treaty agreement. Sounds right. Um, which was negotiated worldwide um, a, a couple of years ago, resulted in a kind of a defeat for the United States, which was trying to use ACTA as a vehicle for, and I've and I mainly focused on the copyright issues and the intellectual property issues, trying to use it as a, as a vehicle for something I referred to in, in my remarks earlier, i.e. this sense of extraterritoriality of trying to extend US law vis-a-vis -vis copyright uh, worldwide. And going further and actually adding all sorts of fascinating um, mechanisms like uh, requiring countries to have the uh, uh, ability to stop people at a border, it's a lot of that being discussed tonight, and go through their laptop just to see if there was anything untoward on there like a, like a pirated movie. Now that was, uh, there was that, that's just one example of a sort of a range of issues the United States wanted to push through ACTA and were defeated. So in the final treaty, countries only have the right to impose a search at, the, uh, at their borders uh, for, for your laptop. They don't actually have to do it or don't actually have to have that sort of mechanism. 
TPP is, is actor round two. TPP is where you know, the empire strikes back and tries to actually reimpose all the things that it was unable to achieve through ACTA in relation to uh, copyright protection, in relation to anti-file sharing measures, uh, a whole bunch of issues around uh, anti-piracy measures, including you know, issues around criminalising file sharing, um, uh, imposing requirements on ISPs like I referred to earlier. So uh, certainly in relation to intellectual property, it's, it's uh, the return of the same threat that we saw in relation to ACTA. Um, and this time there's a very real concern that the, the enormous international pressure that was applied to actually fight off that process in ACTA is not going to be repeated in, in the TPP, partly because it's just being conducted with such great secrecy. Mm. Okay, um, I might see, is there a question over here? No? At the, the back, I'm just trying to go democratically around the circle, so I'll start at the back down here. Yeah, I, um, before maybe um, everyone gets this wrong, I'm totally fully supporting uh, WikiLeaks, but I have a problem that um, the panel is assuming automatically that once um, Julian is extradited to Sweden, it's going to be automatically, he's going to be automatically um, sent to America. And I think uh, um, somehow it's, um, you're just assuming it. And I think uh, Julian and Hassan should first being questioned by, by Sweden, and I think he is no, not doing um, WikiLeaks a very big favour in, by, by staying in, in, in England and refusing to go to, go to Sweden. And, um, and I think he is accused by two women of sexual assault, and I think he really should, uh, he should really answer this, this, this question. And I think another thing is that Sweden is not a, is not a banana republic. And I think then Sweden is much less closer to America than, than England is. So I think he would be much safer in, in Sweden than he would be in England or even, or even down here in, in Australia. Okay, well, let's... Does anybody care to comment on that particular uh, point? I'd like to take that just from a legal perspective. Um, the charges, as I understand it, are charges that are not known to uh, English or Australian uh, law. And the fundamental basis upon which extradition has been conducted now for more than a century is that you can only be extradited uh, if, there are, if there are equivalent charges in the country from which you are being extradited. The charges, as I understand them, in Sweden uh, are so nuanced uh, and uh, what is uh, purported to be sexual assault uh, is not sexual assault. Uh, in the United Kingdom or Australia. So I think it's highly problematic that a citizen should have to go back to another country and answer questions uh, in relation to a charge for which there is no equivalent. The second thing I'd say is the conduct of the prosecutor in a Swedish ha case has been disgraceful. She is a, an individual who is running a hardcore political agenda through her office. She has abrogated her responsibility as a prosecutor, which is to gather evidence and then put it before the court like a counsel assisting. She has behaved in a way uh, which has compromised her position and compromised the Swedish justice system. The second point I'd make is the Swedish justice system uh, is not robust in the way that uh, Australia or the United Kingdom are. In Australia, we don't detain people without charge. Uh, under the anti-terror laws, there is some uh, capacity to do it, but we don't detain people without charge for indefinite periods. We don't use lay judges who have no expertise. Uh, juries are subject to uh, judicial direction uh, on the law. And uh, finally, uh, we don't have secret hearings. Sweden is notorious for having secret criminal trials. The final point I'd make is that the current Swedish government, which is a right of centre government, has given absolutely no indication that it would do anything than roll over and be tickled by their American friends in Washington when it came to Julian Assange. So I don't share your optimism in relation to a country which ought to know better, which once did better, but which is currently, as I say, compromising uh, the legal, uh, fundamental legal principles in order to pursue two agendas. One, a sexual politics agenda, which is a huge issue in Sweden, and secondly, uh, a foreign policy agenda. Okay, I've got Sue and Scott, but 
Um, I just asked this question, which is why, if Julian's not going to be extradited from Sweden rapidly to the United States or else be locked up there and the key thrown away, why is it that when Julian Assange offered to answer the prosecutor's questions in the Swedish embassy in London via telephone, via video link up, that the Swedish prosecutor chose to take up none of those options and instead demanded that Interpol put out a warrant for him to be shipped back to Sweden. So he hasn't been charged with anything. They just want to ask him questions. Well, gee, modern telecommunications is great for asking questions. That's good. Yeah. The last thing I would say as well is that the US does have form in this respect. Um, uh, I know I'm moderating, but I'll, I'll be very brief. I'm, I self-impose my own rules. Um, it's actually got people in Guantanamo that have been held there for now over 10 years without charge, and a number of them simply will stay there seemingly indefinitely, um, unable to be repatriated, but also unable to be uh, charged and processed accordingly. The US, as I said in, when I was speaking before, um, the, Obama has signed the NDAA, the National Defence Authorisation Act, that now permits indefinite detention of non-US citizens. Um, the US government is to be feared in this regard, and we need to treat any of the things that they say with caution and ensure that anybody who is likely to come into their custody and is somebody who they have hostility towards is protected to the highest possible extent. Okay, so going to the, the next corner. Um, I'd like to direct my question to the senator, if I may. Um, given the fact that um, the Greens are exerting a not inconsiderable influence in Parliament at the moment, um, do they have, does the Greens have a position on the issue of Julian Assange? And if so, do they regard it as appropriate to bring it to bear in their bargaining, I suppose, with the government? Is this mic working? It yes. is, yay, okay. Yeah, well, thanks for the question. Uh, the answer, I guess, is yes, and we do and we have. We've got a formal agreement with the government which was signed by Bob and Christine and the PM in August 2010, uh, which relates to, unless there are uh, a couple of very narrow preconditions that we won't crash the government, we won't block supply of the budget and we won't support somebody else's no confidence motion. And apart from that, all bets are off. We vote with them on the carbon bills, we vote against them on radioactive waste and other things that they do. Uh, there was also, you possibly be aware, a list of things uh, that we sought to work on. That was where the carbon price agreement and, and dental care and so on came from. Now, at that stage, Julian wasn't on the list. So I have not sought to add it to the list two years later to say, oh, and by the way, we'll crash the government unless, unless you sort this one out. Um, and maybe I should. Uh, and maybe it'll be on the next agreement. But in the meantime, we're shooting it out on its merits in the way that we have with the other issues that we work on. And there's, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Use the parliament to pull information out of the system with mixed success. Um, use the place as a platform. And we're, we're, we're cooking up some other interventions for later on this year. But if the question is, will I be able to persuade my colleagues to crash the government and elect Tony Abbott in Gillard's place unless they get Julian out of trouble, I'm not sure that's the best course of action. But watch this space. Okay, coming to the front. Uh, thank you so much for honouring the day. My name is Leon. I wish everybody health and happiness. Uh, I want to a little bit make a statement for doctor speaking police uh, broken down this uh, occupied Melbourne. One thing I want to recommend you and remind you, because I'm not teach you, because I'm not your teacher. One thing important in history any people, any government not learn from history. Nobody can broken down power of people. Tank, troop, police, and army doesn't work. Doesn't work. You take it in the mind, power people in the end winner. Maybe later, but in the end winner. One thing, I want one question I ask you. Why you accept capitalist system like Australia and England and the USA, pay million dollars, go to you, uh, go to Middle East and shoot the people, women, baby, children, and come here, make you mentally sick? Thank you. Okay. Um, does anyone care to answer that question? Any comment? I Okay, we might leave that, but if somebody wants to address it in discussion, they're welcome to. I'll take that as comment. I should have done the Tony That's Jones. Yes. Um, right, to the back corner. 
sorry, I'll just remind you, if you do want to s ask a question, please approach one of our lovely staff members from the Wheeler Centre um, to use their microphone. Well, I think this, um, well, this campaign, I, I really appreciate the fact that Sam and Kaz from the WikiLeaks Alliance got this meeting off the ground tonight, because it is true. That's not the full name of their organisation. It's uh, I always forget. WikiLeaks um, Australian Citizens Alliance. Because I think it is disappointing that we had some very big protests when the attacks first happened against WikiLeaks, against Julian Assange, but then things have quietened down since then. And while I know there is a Twitterverse and uh, there is a lot of campaigning on the internet, I also think there is a na need for more on-the-ground opposition. But I think that doesn't come about spontaneously, or if it d does, it might be a few actions, but then it will fizzle away. And that, I think we do need to do some patient building patient coalition building of interests of different people, um, different people, organisations in support of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And I think the work that, um, that Kaz and Sam have got off the ground, I think we need to back and, and try and um, add more bodies and more, and more support to. Because I think the, in, the reason the US, Australia, etc. got away with the Iraq and Afghanistan wars is because of secrecy. They need secrecy in order to carry out these wars. OK, and, I'm going to ask yeah, you a that's, wind up. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, before I take another question from the floor, I'm actually going to take a question from Twitter. Um, this came from Same Font, and uh, the question is, what positive role could Assange play in the Senate? Does anybody want to comment on that? Um, I, I can. <laughs> I'm probably the obvious target for that one. Um, can I just very quickly pick up on, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, the speaker earlier, so I'm not from here, I'm from Fremantle. Is everybody aware of what the deal is when the Supreme Court judgment comes down if there's an extradition order? Where are we all gathering? Who knows that? Shout it out, somebody. DFAT, on the same day, does, did everybody know that? You all do now. You all do now, because I, I completely agree. I wasn't talking down the idea of getting 10,000 people out front of Parliament, by the way. Um, if, we, if we're going to do that, then let's do it. So when you get to DFAT on the day, if Julian's extradited, there'll be a couple of hundred of you or there'll be a couple of thousand of you. That'll be great. Organise on that day the date for the next one and make it ten times larger. And that's what will be happening around the country. I'm sorry? Could you explain the acronyms, please? What was the acronym that I just used? Oh, that's the, de the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And right. thank you. That's a bad habit of mine. So what role could he play in the Senate? Well, two, two immediately come to mind. And the first thing would simply be the campaign, the election campaign, whether Julian's here in Australia and able to conduct it as a free Australian citizen, whether he's needing to do it from house arrest or somewhere incarcerated, quite literally. Um, the issues that he raises and that the organisation works on we'll get more time on the front page. And that, to my mind, is enormously positive and will do really good things for the political culture here where it's, where it's difficult um, to, to raise this kind of stuff. Whistleblowing protection, freedom of information, war, you know, diplomacy, human rights here and overseas. I think that could only be positive. I won't speak for him in terms of the kind of issues that he'd pursue if he got elected. Um, Phil Dawling wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago on the basis of a conversation with him where he outlined some of his agenda. But we, I think we only need to look at the agenda that the organisation has pursued since 2006, the kind of issues that it's gone after and the work that it's done, to get a bit of a sense of what flavour that would bring to the political debate here, and goodness knows we need it. Come on, Bennett, as a member of the political I'll, look, I'll put, I'll put my, I'll put my, put my political commentator, um, rubbish talker, hat on. <laughs> and, I mean, one thing that regardless of what you might think otherwise about Julian Assange, he is a genius at getting up the noses of the powerful. And it seems to me his, his, uh, the, the announcement about, about investigating a run for the Senate was another example of his almost effortless ability to upset people and stir people up. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genius. And... Um, it's partly the reason why he's in so much trouble. But um, 
the, the linking that into the Australian political process, think about, I mean, Scott's just outlined some of this, think about his capacity to actually generate headlines and newsprint on political issues. I mean, it's going to add, uh, you know, a significant disruptive force to, uh, uh, to, to elections. So it's a, just as a, as a political observer, I, I think it would be absolutely fascinating because I'm not quite sure how the press gallery would go about trying to process Julian Assange mm. and his, because he's a, in, in terms of generating media, the man is a force of nature that I don't think Australia has seen for a very long time. So if I can talk wearing uh, the academic hat for a minute, um, there's a bit of a theory, um, quite classical theory in sort of management and public policy that's around whether or not you have giant leaps forward in government or whether you have what's termed in the literature muddling through. Um, and are you an incrementalist? Are you just building one thing at a time, taking tiny steps, or are you making big advances? I think that Julian Assange would probably be in the big advances category. Um, and it would seem to me, from my observation of government, that there needs to be a bit of both to have successful government and successful democracy. That's how society progresses forward on our spectrum of civilization. Okay, so I'll go over to this section, which is next on the list. Um, yes, uh, uh, about 18 months ago, um, the press was running stories about Martin Ferguson um, and his resources agenda, uh, particularly to do with coal. Um, but they were, he was leaning on the state police departments to enforce a tighter um, regime as far as people who protested, particularly in regard to any of the, well, in regard to any of the resources, but particularly in regard to coal, um, because this was seen as being unfriendly to foreign interests, essentially. Uh, the story dropped, but it's obvious from the recent stuff of quick coal and people being rung by the police department visited, uh, having early morning visits, even though they've just participated in peaceful protest, that there's some sort of, and the age at the same time running stories suggesting that ASIO is, has a direct surveillance on such groups. Um, there seems to be some sort of level of collusion happening between federal and state authorities um, in regard to that and to the point where they're, um, to be monitoring the um, internet um, manifestations of these various groups. Do you have like a question about it, or is it, is it just going to be a comment? I'm just wondering if um, is there any attempt in, it, in the federal government to get? I suppose it should be for the chap on the end. Um, to get a um, clarification on the degree to which there's collusion between the state and federal government over such surveillance. I'll, I'll be really brief on this. I see it more as a collusion between government in general subordinating the public interest to the interests of a very, very narrow sector of the business community that has told us, and, and that's one really naked example of, hey, Martin Ferguson, why don't you use our clandestine surveillance agencies and policing agencies to smash and disrupt protest while we wreck the climate on which civilization depends. I'm not sure if I could put it any more blatantly than that. It's a suicidal economic blindness being pursued now and they want us out of the way. It's not much more complex than that. I mean, collusion or coordination between state and federal intelligence and policing agencies happens all the time. It's normal, some of it's healthy. What really creeps me out is the idea that they'd ring on Martin Ferguson's door, hey, who, li who here lives in the electorate of Batman? I don't normally per personalise these things, but Martin's different. More hands, please. Anybody want to move to Batman? <laughs> please, ladies and gentlemen, next election, please sort that out. Sort that out, for heaven's sake. That's probably enough from me. On that. <laughs> yep. It's a, it's a oh, bit of, it's sorry. a pity that Martin's got the safest seat in, in, uh, in the country, Scott. But anyway, um, the, the, I mean, there's a systemic issue here too. When you give, uh, when you, when you massively increase ASIO's um, budget, when you give it a beautiful, well, actually not beautiful, but absolutely enormous 
hideously ugly building uh, as its <laughs> new headquarters. And when you, when you regularly increase its powers, what do you think it's going to do with that? I mean, it's got all these resources and it's got this expanded remit. What do you think it's going to do? It's going to go out looking for anything that can possibly manufacture into a threat in order to justify its existence. That's, that's, what, that's what entities do. They justify their existence. And, uh, and uh, ASIO, just, the, the sheer remorseless growth of ASIO uh, in recent years in a legal and a financial sense, um, it, you know, requires a hell of a lot, a lot of justification. And, and this, this delegitimization of healthy dissent uh, is part and parcel of that. Can I just jump and say one sure. thing? Um, I wouldn't want you to walk away thinking that we're painting ASIO as the evil organization. It's not like that. I think there are, like any organization, probably very good and very not so good people in it. It's not ASIO's fault in a sense. It, the, the responsibility rests with our politicians because they think that what we want to hear is, oh my God, the war on terror, let's throw money at it. We can solve it. We can make it go away. And so when I said before, the power is in your hands, speak up, I meant tell them that's not the message they should be hearing. That's not how you want to spend your taxpayer money. You've got other agendas like making sure that waiting lists in public hospitals are cut in half those other important things we have in our society. So we're not trying to, I think, just blame every ASIO officer because it's not like that. Mm. Mm. Okay, I'll take one more question from the floor. And hello to the ASIO focus. <laughs> Anyone from ASIO in the audience? Yeah, raise your hand. They're watching online, I <laughs> <laughs> You're deep undercover, Matt. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Um, I'm just wondering if there is any effort on the part of WikiLeaks to obtain and publish the, uh, the text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement because it would be really good if the people of the world knew what was, trying, bench, uh, what was being attempted to be imposed on them. I don't, I don't think WikiLeaks goes out and seeks documents out. I don't think that's their, their model. It's a, it's a blind drop box. So to the public servants out there, to the negotiating teams, to the people on the inside of that particular bubble, there's your invitation. You can't do it through WikiLeaks at the moment because that organisation has been attacked and is momentarily down. But just drop it to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age, please, out there. But WikiLeaks don't go out seeking stuff, as far as I'm aware. Right. OK, well, that might be a good opportunity to close the discussion. Um, I'd like to let you all know that you're invited to approach the cameras at the back of the room and talk about why WikiLeaks is important to you or why you think our democracy uh, deserves defence. Um, you can leave a brief message on camera and it can be directed to the PM, the AG or the Foreign Minister if you would so choose. There's also a petition on the desk up the back if you would like to sign that rather than put your mug on a camera. Um, and if you're interested in being involved in this campaign, um, you need to get in touch with the WikiLeaks Australian Citizens Alliance, or WACA. You can find them. They've got a presence online. They've got a presence on Twitter, and you're now all obligated to get on Twitter if you're not there. Um, and you can see, about, see what events they're planning, but also see how you can participate in that process and promote it as well. I'd like to thank all of our panellists, and I'd like you to give them another round of applause now. I'd like to most importantly thank Kaz and Sam from WACA and from the Wheeler Centre. So I should say also the kindly staff from the Wheeler Centre who are always professional and run a great show. I'd like to thank the staff of Federation Square who also do the same in this beautiful venue here in Melbourne and say a big goodbye to the people online who are watching. Thank you very much for coming and we hope to see you again soon.